Alrighty. So, hello, everyone, and welcome everyone to our clinical conversation session uh, for, for the month of February. I'm Barry Sarvett, and I'm the statewide medical director for PATH. And uh, you, uh, you know that if you don't know, it is a pediatric disorder associated with otherwise as death. Uh, a few housekeeping items. Um, first and foremost, um, just uh, know that the sessions being recorded uh, will be available on the MCPAP, MCPAP website at www.mcpap.org. Uh, the copy of the PowerPoint will be available also on the MCPAP website under the um, archived news and webinars page, which is on the About tab on the website. Uh, we we'll have time at the end for questions. Um, so if you have a question as uh, the presentation is going along, just type into the question box uh, your question, and we will read out your question. And or unmute your line at the end to enable you to ask questions. And if you would uh, be kind enough to fill out a brief survey after the presentation, we would appreciate that. So today's uh, presenter is Dr. Michelle Casoli Reardon. Um, Dr. Casoli Reardon received her medical degree from the Pennsylvania State University College of Medicine and did her residency in at, at Brown. Um, she's actually a triple boarder, uh, which means that she did uh, she's she did uh, pediatrics, uh, psychiatry, and child psychiatry all at Brown University in the triple board program. She previously worked. Um, at adolescent unit at Kearney Hospital in Dorchester. Uh, the medical director for Medicare and uh, formerly the medical director for the partial hospital program at North Shore for the past uh, 10 years. A psychiatrist uh, uh, within our McPat program, of course, um, and has uh, a very uh, extensive experience in treating uh, children uh, with PANDAS. Um, and she frequently consults to primary care docs in this area to help with um, the care of these patients. So uh, thank you for uh, your um, efforts, uh, Michelle, and uh, we're really looking forward to hearing your presentation. So uh, go, go right ahead uh, and uh, proceed. Thank you. Um, Beth, if you can just keep an arrow out when Beth talking, I kind of heard him going in and out just to make sure people can hear me completely and if people can't, just to let Beth know. So first of all, um, I want to thank everyone for joining. I, if, for those of you who have worked with me, you'll know that I am very passionate about this topic. Um, and so um, I'm really happy to try to help uh, give some insight and education on this. Beth, do you want to go to the next slide? Yep. Uh, first of all, PANDAS is not a new thing. It's been around and documented for about a century now, despite the fact that there still tends to be some controversy around it. Um, PANDAS itself has been documented with rheumatic fever, in which kids with rheumatic fever would go on week after their illness to develop a career form movement disorder. Additionally, there are other many other autoimmune encephalopathies uh, that occur. Um, more recently, in the past decade, there's been one called the NMDA receptor autoimmune encephalopathy. And for those of you who may or may not know, this was um, detailed in a book called Brain on Fire by Susan Callahan. She was a journalist for the New York Times who, at the age of 24, um, suddenly developed this uh, encephalopathy following a uh, viral infection. Her first symptom she developed was psychosomania. She believed that her apartment was infested with bugs, that her dad was going to hurt her or the people in the family. She presented grandiose, euphoric, um, and pressured. And only after almost three months on an EEG monitoring unit at New York, at NYU uh, Hospital, that they discovered that the real reason was because she had uh, this autoimmune disorder. Um, PANDAS, as a result of cross reactivity of the antibodies to strap um, to our basal ganglia, um, including your cardiac and your glopalidus. Um, it has binding to multiple receptors and targets, but particularly to your dopamine receptors. Uh, and what we know 
about our basal ganglia is that the caudate in particular is a source of obsessive thoughts and ticks. So it makes sense that if you have something affecting this part of your brain, that you will see this kind of symptoms come out of, um, out of this particular part of your brain. There are also um, systemic abnormalities that occur with um, this disorder, and uh, particularly the cytokines that uh, will affect the blood-brain area and cause it to be more leaky. Um, it's estimated that about more than 80% of all patients and kids who have pandas have some sort of autoimmune um, abnormality, abnormality themselves. Um, there's also a very strong family history of immune disorders, particularly on the mother's side, and it's one of the key questions that needs to be asked when screening for pandas. Infections, there are also infections that can kind of set off pandas, so even in the absence of strep, you can see a pandas, and nowadays we sometimes refer to as pans, um, and drop out the strep um, as a result of other infections. The most common that we tend to see is actually mycoplasm particularly this time of year and then again in about February and March. And I've actually already seen several cases of mycoplasm being linked with pandas uh, in the past couple of months. So that's an important one to kind of keep in the back of your mind. But because of the fact that other things can kind of set this up for kids, um, it is important to do more than just a strap screen. And we'll talk a little bit about what kind of um, labs uh, and work should be done for most of these kids. We um, that. Uh, disorders and infections can cause an increased risk of uh, psychic disorders in uh, children even as early as in utero. Um, there's a uh, four, four and a half percent increase of uh, schizophrenia um, for, ki for children born of moms who are exposed to toxoplasmosis and herpes 2 as well too. And so there's a lot of um, room for uh, education and for research around a lot of this because clearly it's not so clear that um, psychiatry is psychiatry and that a lot of these disorders actually have underlining um, causes or etiologies um, beyond what we may really believe uh, occur. There's also um, been a link between the use of some of our different kind of medications, uh, for example, Thorazine um, and Clotrol that can actually inhibit viral replication um, in some of these disorders. And so some of the improvement that at times you may see with patients who are psychotic or manic is thought to perhaps even be the result of these medications and their ability to inhibit um, viral load and, and, uh, and um, affect brain. But to the next one. So PIS itself. Um, is defined by the abrupt um, onset of obsessive and compulsive symptoms. Um, you can also, plus or minus, have tics. Sometimes uh, kids present just with tics. Sometimes they present with OCD. And sometimes they present with a combination of it. About 30% of the time, you will see, uh, uh, just, I'm sorry, 20% of the time, you'll see just tics as a pre predominant presenting uh, complaint in pandas. You can also see very severe onset of eating disorders where kids will actually stop eating completely. Um, and along with that, the following symptoms, including uh, kids struggling in school, um, problems with concentration, attention, lots of uh, visual spatial uh, effects. Handwriting becomes very, very poor. Kids can develop very regressive um, behaviors and become incredibly oppositional, um, argumentative, uh, in times even assaultive, particularly to family members, very labile. They'll complain of depression and feeling sad, and they'll have very obsessive anxiety, and particularly you may see separation anxiety among our younger kids, and that can be a result of a fear of harm, um, and with kids uh, not being able to really verbalize that the fear, the underlying fear of that separation is that something bad may happen to myself or my parents if I'm not with them. These uh, options will result in compulsions and rituals, some of which you won't even be aware about or, or won't really um, appreciate, um, and can have obviously movement disorders. But the other thing we tend to see a lot is a lot of hyperactivity, and what I consider to be an acathetic like um, uh, symptom where kids get very, very restless, and sometimes this can even happen at the very onset before you even see some of the obsessive or compulsive behaviors come out. And I've often just have heard from parents that, uh, or from teachers, that their kids are literally um, going on tables and squirming around, um, and that is likely an effect.
effect again on that caudate um, and that part of your brain and the binding of those antibodies actually causing that excessive acathetic movement. Be lots of sensory integration, integration problems. So again, parents will say, you know, my kids have suddenly become uh, sensitive to clothing. They won't wear certain things, or they won't eat, eat certain foods. That can also affect the eating and um, can cause some of the eating difficulties in many of these kids. There's some real significant sleep problems. There are issues with kids being able to fall asleep at nighttime, as well as the fact that many of them will wake up complaining of nightmares and then have trouble falling to sleep or go into their parents' room and disrupt um, their parents' sleeping as well. And their screening question that would be asked, because that is something that is very separate and discrete to PANDA as opposed to quote unquote regular OCD. Um, and sometimes parents will just say that their kid is peeing a lot or going to the bathroom a lot. And again, that may be a result of, um, of some of uh, some of those symptoms they're seeing. Kids will claim very frequently of joints, muscles, um, and other things hurting them. Um, parents will oftentimes think that's just growing pains for their kids, um, but it's very common for me here that kids will say, my, uh, my um, legs hurt me, my dad. My arms hurt me, mom and dad, and that will go along with the course of pandas. Typically, we'll see a waxing and waning course over time, although this can sometimes be difficult, and I often see kids who are a little bit older um, and have probably had the pandas going on but weren't diagnosed, um, and I sometimes find that this is the case for many kids when they're referred from PCPs because what will happen is the parents will come in to see the PCP, they'll be in this big crisis. My kid is, you know, really emotional. My kid is really anxious. And then they'll leave the pediatrician's office and things will get better. And then, again, you know, you won't see them until there's a sudden crisis, another onset or exacerbation of the illness. And so these are kids and families who are coming in and out to pediatrician's offices. And it's not until you kind of finally hit this threshold that um, they may be referred or the, the thought of pandas actually occur to people. Typically, the onset is around school age, so we, we most commonly see this as kids transition into school. Um, it occurs young as three, um, but also should be considered in any kid under the age of 13 um, who presents with OCD and ticks. And the, the particular occurrence of school um, and, and the onset pants is really important because, again, we very often hear that kids will start to go into school they may be okay with going to school the first week or so, and then all of a sudden they develop this really bad separation anxiety. They won't go to school. They're crying. They're clinging. And then it'll get better. So what everyone will think is, well, that was just some transition into school. And, and the reason why they wouldn't separate from mom or dad was because um, they would transition to school. Now everything's better, and therefore that just proves that theory. Um, and so, again, kind of having that in the back of your mind, if you have a kid who presents with really bad separation anxiety, could this be actually pandas and not just kind of a normative separation issue as they're going to school? This is much more common in boys than in girls. Um, and it's actually thought to account for up to a third of all OCD that's seen in children and adolescents. So that's a pretty good percentage of kids. And the reality is we probably don't even know the real numbers. That may be an underestimate of what's truly out there. Pandas itself is a very, very heterogeneous uh, disorder. So you will see um, both differences in the severity as well as the different symptoms. And even within the same kid, um, different exacerbations can have different severity, different symptoms. So you may have a kid who presents the first time with separation anxiety and they're worried about getting sick or they're worried about uh, that they're, they're refusing to eat. And then the next time, they may present with ticks or the next time they may present with another form of OCD or compulsions that they're doing, spell numbers or just right behaviors. So each episode can be very different than the last, and it may be that that first episode is the worst and the kid is really miserable and oppositional, aggressive, or it may not be that it's the second or third or fourth episode that that occurs in. Or in some kids, that may not happen at all. Next slide. So labs are helpful in confirming the diagnosis, diagnosis of pandas, it's really important to remember that that is not a confirmation. 
that, that does not exclude PANDAS. So PANDAS and PANS is still a diagnosis based on symptoms and not on lab work. And many, many times people will call me and say, well, you know, the labs came back and they were okay and the tires were okay, but the kid still has all the symptoms of PANDAS. And I'll say, you know, that that's fine. It would have been nice if we saw those ASO titers elevated, but it may be that we're actually catching this kid at a different stage of the illness, whether it be towards the end or very early on, I should still treat the pandas like pandas. So even in the absence of a clear infectious cause, we do recommend a course of antibiotics, um, and we'll talk a little bit about kind of what are those choices or, or what are the best choices for kids. Um, because of the different symptoms um, that can, uh, can present um, and because uh, strep can oftentimes be very insidious for some kids, about, it's maybe about 50% of all kids with strep can be asymptomatic um, and may not present to a pediatrician, but things like vomiting, headaches, low-grade fever may be a symptom of an underlying strep infection. So when we, um, when we tell parents after we diagnose them with PANDAS, we say, okay, well, Anything, you know, from basically your head down to your stomach that your kid is struggling with should be screened for strep. Um, it may be that you think that little, you know, viral illness that lasted uh, for a couple of days and went away is actually a symptom of strep, and that we just don't know, and it went away on its own. You can see pants not just with strep pharyngitis, but you can also see it with perianal dermatitis, and I hear that and see that um, from uh, a lot of parents and a lot of kids. Um, and so, again, um, being aware of that is also really important. Strep is not a precipitant for children. Um, that's why I mentioned that there's this designation now of PANS in, for a lot of kids. So the workup is uh, pretty extensive, and we include lots of um, workup for lots of different immune disorders and immune markers. Um, so strep cultures would be one. Um, titers, including your strep titers, including AS ASO and uh, DSA, um, Type well, but we also check for Lyme. As I mentioned, mycoplasm is a very common one that we see, um, and then things like thyroid and ANA, um, rheumatoid factors. That we do a complement panel to look at inflammation, CV with diff, and then we look at CMP to look for fasting glucose and the possibility of an underlying uh, diabetes presentation, especially with the fact that many of these kids will present with uh, polyuria. Viral illnesses, especially once primed, can also also um, lead to an exacerbation of uh, pandas. Again, probably one of the most common ones we'll see is the hand, foot, mouth, uh, Coxsackie virus that will uh, precipitate pandas in, in lots of kids. Um, and so with more illnesses, to be with that, it may not be strep, it may be other things. And to be really, we say to parents and kids, you need to be hypervigilant um, about um, any of this stuff. And if your kid is sick, sick or your new school nurse needs to let you know if there's anyone in the class or, or anyone in the school who actually has strep because kids are very sensitive once they've been uh, diagnosed with parents or primed to the exposure to the strep to further exacerbations of their illnesses. Um, the, the workup for the workup may be negative. It is important um, to look at making sure Sure that there are not other things going on, um, that the, the symptoms that you're seeing are not a result of an underlying uh, neurological disorder. Um, and so we do recommend that at least consideration with uh, a consultation with a neurologist to look at whether or not it's appropriate for an RI or EEG or further neurological workup should be done as well too. Of note, the, um, the Susan uh, Callahan, who I mentioned, uh, who had the NMDA receptor, um, antibody autoimmune disorder, she had a completely normal workup. All her labs were normal, her MRI is normal, even her EEG, despite the fact that she um, presented to the hospital having a grand mal seizure, normal, and they had trouble on the, uh, on the seizures unit even, be, even being able to capture a lot of the seizures she was having. So despite all of that, kids sometimes look at a workup that's very normal, despite despite having this uh, underlying uh, autoimmune uh, cephalopathy going on. Next slide. And earlier, you can see ticks that can occur alone or sometimes with the um, OCD. The ticks can include a variety of things. They can be simple motor ticks, eye blinking. Um, they can be a vocal tick, 
triggering, or sometimes they can be much more complex, and those more complex ticks can be difficult to differentiate between what's a tick and what's a ritual or obsession. Um, so sometimes, for example, I could do something like they'll tap on the table three times, they'll hop and turn around, and people will think, well, maybe that's a or ritual that they're doing, but when you go and treat them and use something like clonidine, that goes away and we find out, oh, that's actually a tick that's occurring as part of their pandas. Tick occur in about 30% of pandas patients um, as their initial presentation. The uh, presence of ticks actually predicts a much more significant issue with cognition and academic performance as well as eating problems. So again, when you see ticks either alone or with um, OCD stuff, that's important to kind of remember kids may actually struggle a lot more in school and you may have a lot more eating issues with these kids. It's not really clear why that is, um, but that is something that has been observed. Could occur, um, it occur include problems with attention, focus. Um, kids have problems where they st uh, their grades start, start to drop um, and their handwriting becomes very, very poor and difficult to read. Um, this can be difficult to kind of tell because there's a comorbidity with OCD and ticks and pandas with ADHD. So it may be that in that particular that young kid, that five-year-old kid who may actually have ADHD there and baseline have issues with ADHD or focus, just come on top of that and everything gets worse. And so people aren't initially sure, well, are the attentional issues just the pandas or is there something else there? And it may be just time when we treat the pandas and we see them getting better with the pandas, they're able to go back and look at, is there really some comorbid ADHD there as well? Too. So that's important to keep in the back of your mind and have, and have as a one of those things to kind of rule out when you're dealing with a lot of these kids. There are a lot of sensory issues that can occur in kids with pandas. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this, this can really cause lots of problems with their eating. Kids will sometimes just refuse to eat. We will see kids who lose weight, um, and at times, sometimes kids even have to be admitted to the hospital because they refuse to eat and they get dehydrated. There's secondary enuresis, encopresis, polyuria, the algaes that they complain, and lots of somatic. So a lot of times we'll hear from parents, yeah, my kids frequently complain about aches or they're sick to the stomach. And as I mentioned earlier, this may be related to the fact that we're not picking up all the strep infections that a lot of these kids are having, and we may be seeing undiagnosed strep infections. But in general, um, kids with pandas are known to just be more somatic. They just seem to be more achy and complain more of not feeling well. And there is a lot of fatigue that can occur with pandas and kids just feeling tired um, and, and very lethargic oftentimes. A lot of the other symptoms that occur with pandas, kids, I oftentimes will have kids who come in and have a prior diagnosis of autistic spectrum disorder. So these kids will have impaired eye contact. They won't make eye contact when they're struggling with acute exacerbation. They have very atypical behaviors and mannerisms because of all of the sessions, the ritualistic and compulsive behaviors that they have, as well as some of the complex tics. They become very aggressive, um, and so people think that developmental regression is a result of uh, them being along the spectrum. And the rigidity around teens and obsessive interests also can be confused with um, them being developmentally um, delayed or along the spectrum. So earlier, very, very, very variable. You can see anything from very mild cases um, or very, very severe illnesses where kids end up in the hospital or may need to be medically admitted. Um, the course itself can also be variable. variable. Sometimes we have kids come in, they have one episode, they go off, they either have a very rare episode going forward in the future, or maybe none at all. And then other kids who just have frequent and almost chronic um, episodes that occur either throughout or particularly during the school year, but even sometimes through the summer. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about um, what to do with some of those kids. The initial studies that came out of the National Institute of Mental Health uh, showed that or, or found that the time for PANDAS occurs over about a two to three year course and then, then will go away. Clinically, that's not what we see, and I think people are really looking at that. And clinically, what we see is, yes, PANDAS will go away or this this um, this 
autoimmune response will go away, but it may not happen until the kid sometimes enters adolescence, and then we tend to stop seeing that. Um, kids may go on in adolescence to actually have genetic, quote unquote, regular OCD, um, but that is, but the pandemic itself may actually last for sometimes years in kids. We look at kind of what are some of the obsessions and the fears that kids struggle with. As I mentioned earlier, separation anxiety is probably one of the biggest ones and will lead to school refusal um, because of those fears of harm to themselves or their parents. These separation anxieties will cause a lot of nighttime rituals um, where parents are having to sleep with their kids, where, pa where kids are going to the parents' room to sleep with them, where parents are have to have to do all these rituals around checking locks or checking doors or checking closets or saying special things to them to make sure that they feel safe. Um, they will frequently go and check in with their parents. So they will go to their parents and they'll say, you know, mom and dad, when are you going to be home? Mom and dad, when are you going to be home? And, and kind of constantly, repeatedly look for their parents to reassure them that, yes, they're going to be okay, that, yes, um, that both the kid and the parents are going to be okay and nothing's going to be wrong. And at times, the fear of harm can even be mistaken for what is um, appears suicidality in kids. So what I mean by that is it is very common when, when people and kids have these fears of harm that they'll have intrusive images of harm. They can have intrusive images of harming themselves, intrusive images of harming other people, or even other times intrusive sexualized images towards themselves or other people. So those, in, those images can be things like I've had kids who say, I have an image, I see a knife, and I have an image of picking up that knife and stabbing myself. And it terrifies me because I think, what if um, I stab myself? That can be mistaken as that kid being suicidal, but it's not that that kid wants to hurt themselves. It's that that, that kid is having an image, an obsessive image, and is actually terrified. Um, and OCD is always about the what ifs. It's always about what if this happens. Um, and so when you hear kids complaining about, you know, I, I, worry about, I worry about this, what if? Um, if this could happen, what if um, that happened? That is typically what you'll see with pandas um, and, and typically what you'll see with kids with OCD. Another big obsession that kids struggle with is contamination. Um, choke and vomiting, again, the choking and vomiting can keep kids from eating. They'll refuse to eat. The contamination, again, will cause kids to refuse to eat. They won't eat foods because they'll be afraid that the food are spoiled um, or they'll get sick from it. Um, kids will do things like they'll check labels or look for um, expiration dates. Um, they'll refuse to eat certain foods. They'll refuse to eat foods if anyone's touched them. All of those kind of things can be associated with that particular, those particular obsessions. Kids will present with a, a fear or a need for what we call symmetry. Kids having to have in their head things perfect, right? Um, and you may see some of this come out, uh, particularly at school, uh, around schoolwork, uh, routines. So make parents do things in a certain way, say things in a certain way. They'll refuse to wear certain clothing, um, sometimes because of sense issue, but also sometimes because it just doesn't feel right. When they put on those pair of pants, they don't feel right, and so I have to keep on changing my pants until I feel, find those pair of pants that feel right on me and feel, feel good. Um, you can have lots of problems with that kind of just right or that symmetry around your eating because kids can develop a lot of body dysmorphia. Again, my body doesn't look just right, and so I have to do things to control my body. And so some, some of, uh, sometimes we'll actually present, even the older kids will present with what's to be an anorexia nervosa and then a, a separate eating disorder, and that may actually be pandas. Uh, you see uh, is, uh, issues around superstition, so um, superstitious fears or obsessions. Kids will have to do things in what I consider special numbers. So it may be that, um, you know, kids say, I have to have the radio or the TV on volume, on even volume numbers, so I can only do it on number two or four. It can't be on odd number. Um, I don't really know why, but they just know that those numbers are kind of like special and that they have to do it, that their brain kind of tells them they have to do it. And then things like go back and check um, because if I didn't, something bad may happen. So if I don't go back and check that lock, maybe something bad will happen. They have tick, um, tick kind of behaviors and movements that 
look like these are actually part of a superstitious, for example, I mentioned that kind of little tapping. So kids may have to tap their leg three times, and then if they tapped one foot, they may have to tap the other foot, um, again, to ward off uh, bad, bad luck in some way. The years of insects, and, and this could be um, this can be actually be really interesting because there are times and and there are times when kids may present with what is appears to be a hallucination that may actually be related to intrusive images, um, and this happens most often with young kids who may not be able to verbalize what's really going on and that that what they're experiencing is an intrusive image. So, for example. I've had a pediatrician call me and say that he had a parent call me in panic because the three the year old kid in the back was sitting in the back seat of the car and the son started to scream and yell that she had bugs crawling all over her. And so I said to the pediatrician, Well maybe check for a strep because this maybe this is handed. And so he called me back a couple of days later and he said, How'd you know that? Because in fact, this was strep and it was pandas. And I said, because it's not, you know, in kids, visual and hallucinations or auditory hallucinations are not something that's really common. It's not something you can see. So if you're hearing that, it may be a developmental way that a kid is expressing what's actually going on in their head. Um, and so kind of keep that in mind. If you have a four or five year old saying, I'm seeing something or I'm feeling something, um, seems like it's hallucination, maybe it's really not. I had another kid who was hospitalized at one point um, that presented because he saw someone going into his house to kill his parents and kill his mom. And so they thought he was psychotic. I happened to see him when I was rounding on the unit. I noticed that he had a tick. Um, and he, uh, when I talked to him, he talked a lot about just being afraid, being afraid that maybe something bad was going to happen and that someone was going to come and hurt his family. And so that was actually panned in him, but came up across to people as being kind of paranoid and psychosis and a visual hallucination. When in reality, when we went and then did his pandas, all of that remitted and went away. There can be a lot of behavioral issues for these kids. And oftentimes that is a big presenting um, issue that pediatricians and some other people see. Um, it can be very problematic. Uh, parents come to you and they are just exhausted between all of the rituals that their kids are making them engage in and the behavioral and anxiety that uh, that is occurring in many of these kids. Parents are just coming absolutely frazzled and not knowing what to do. Kids can have pick attacks or present with panic-like symptoms. They will have prolonged tantrums, sometimes hours on end. They'll have aggression, particularly towards their parents, um, and they'll be incredibly, incre incredibly oppositional. And a lot of times that's related to the fact that parents may not realize it, but they're refusing to engage in rituals um, that that kid wants them to engage in. And so when you either won't engage in that ritual or you pre prevent that kid from doing that compulsion or ritual, they will become incredibly agitated and angry and explosive. And so some of that uh, oppositional behavior may be a result of that. A lot of problems with sleep. Um, the sleep can be very problematic for these kids. Like I mentioned, there's problems with falling asleep. They'll wake up in the mor early morning. They'll have these obsessive th nightmares. So they'll tell me, um, yeah, I had this recurrent dream, Dr. Reardon, about um, someone breaking into my house and killing my family. And I, I don't want to go to sleep at night because I'm afraid I'm going to have this dream. I wake up in the middle of the night with this nightmare, and then I'm afraid to go back to sleep because sometimes when I do go back to sleep, I'll go right back into this nightmare. And they'll describe this happening recurrently over nights and nights and nights. So this is not like they have one nightmare, but this is like I have this recurrent nightmare. And oftentimes it's very vivid for them. So the what I consider kind of the OCD, quote unquote, nightmares tend to be very vivid and realistic for kids. And therefore, um, and I'm much related to these kind of obsessive themes and, and, and very distinct manner. They'll choose to sleep alone, as I mentioned, or they'll be going to their parents' room to sleep with them or sleep on the floor. Um, lots of lability. People can even think, or they'll be you know, misdiagnosed in some cases with being bipolar. Um, they may be uh, complaining of or treated for depression, issues with hyperactivity, the restlessness, and the refusal to eat. Next uh, slide, Beth. So there actually were uh, 
really a really great set of guidelines that were developed uh, by consensus board last year, 2017, um, that comprime, that were made up of uh, specialists from across the country and across uh, subspecialties to come up with treatment guidelines for treaters. And they're very comprehensive. However, at the end of uh, this presentation, I do uh, give the link to those um, guidelines if anyone wants them. They are available online. They were published in the Journal of uh, American and Child Analysis and Psychiatry um, and available to anyone. Uh, the goal of those guidelines was because it is felt that in general, for most cases of PANDAS and PANS, the pediatricians and PCPs can manage this. Um, and it's really not something that needs to always be referred or seen by a child psychiatrist or a specialist. It is to consider consultation uh, from a specialist with a multi-team approach. So, for example, I very commonly work with Mark Pachinek over at MGH and uh, Infectious ID, um, and he helps with managing antibiotic choices, especially uh, prophylactic antibiotic choices in some of these kids, while I may uh, manage a lot of the psychiatric behavioral and uh, emotional issues that are occurring in these kids. The amended first-line treatment for a kid with PANDAS is two weeks of an antibiotics. Um, options, and, and again, if you look at the initial studies out of the NIMH, the initial studies were done with amoxicillin augmentin, so that would be one of the um, first-line choices, but also um, very commonly we'll use uh, zithromycin or one of the cephalosporins. If, if it has mycoplasm, as many of you know, the treatment for mycoplasm tends to be different than the treatment from strep, so it is not reasonable to think of using Zithromax um, to treat a kid before even before they have that confirmation back, because it may be that this is precipitated or caused by mycoplasm, and mycoplasm responds to the zithromycins or um, oxycycline, um, and so it may be that um, you know you need to use those antibiotics instead. The voice of that first trial may not work for kids, um, especially if kids have had prior episodes or have had some undiagnosed strep. So it may be. Amoxicillin doesn't really work, and so have to try another one. And it's completely appropriate to do another course. So I'll do that course of amoxicillin. They don't really get better. They maybe only get marginally better. And then I'll give them a second course of a different um, antibiotic, and, and I sort of get them a response. And that tends to work actually very well for most kids. For kids, if they, particularly during the school year, we may actually have to put them on prophylaxis. Um, a, you give them a low dose of Zithromax, um, and what that does is helps mitigate their um, their reaction to strep, um, particularly when they're in school and strep is everywhere, or everywhere around them. And we do this in kids where we've seen at least three uh, penis episodes um, during the school year. And so I'll commonly say, okay, well, in September we put you on a low Zithromax, and we continue until about June, and then we stop for the summer, and we give you the summer off. Most kids do really well with that and don't need a whole lot of, a whole lot of other um, interventions. We do also, during an acute exacerba exacerbation, uh, use um, uh, uh, the leaves or uh, the NSAIDs because uh, there is an inflammatory response. Um, it's important to use this in lo along with it. And I have parents who say to me, even before they get the diagnosis, and find out that, yes, this, there's strep there, and yes, this is PANDAS, and we do an antibiotic, that they, when they start the Motrin or they start the Aleve, that their kid already starts to get better. And uh, Mark Pasternak actually usually has kids continue along with the prophylactic antibiotic, giving uh, a daily dose of Aleve or Motrin every day. So for those kids who need prolaxis, um, oftentimes they end up on a, a daily antibiotic plus a daily Motrin Aleve. We sometimes use probiotics if we have kids with that perianal dermatitis, and that will help also with uh, clearing the strep from their gut. Um, if there are lots of safety issues, if kids are presenting in such, uh, acute distress or with such behavioral problems, aggression or self-harm, then certainly we may look, need to look at hospitalizations either psychiatrically or medically in the cases where kids aren't eating or restricting their eating. Slide. All children, regardless of their age, um, should be referred for 
uh, therapy when they when you diagnose and when they develop pandas. Um, and that is a recommendation that came out of these guidelines. And the reason for that is kind of two part. One is that when it comes to the OCD, it really helps parents not only, and kids not only understand the na nature of the illness and the OCD, but also helps give them some tools around how to help their kid and not engage in the rituals with their kid. And it gives the kids themselves tools for going forward to not only help themselves, but if I have another exacerbation, then what, what I do instead of doing these uh, rituals and studying, engaging in the rituals. And you would be surprised, even some very young kids, I have kids as young as five or six, who can do very good, very structured um, exposure relapse preventive therapy. And this is in part because ERP, as we call it, is a visual spatial kind of therapy. It's very different than when kids go in and they talk about how they're doing. Kids who do ERP, they're actually given a calendar um, and they sit there with their therapist and they de identify what are all the obsessions and what are the different rituals that they do. And then through, during the course of the week between when they see their therapist, they actually have to rate how often they're having different kinds of uh, obsessions, how bad are those obsessions, and then are they engaging rituals or are not able to engage in rituals and do something else and, and distract themselves. So it's really important at the get-go that we do this because it will help kids in the long run as well as with medications. I times we use things to help with the sleep because it's such a problem for so many kids. Um, it can be something as simple, simple as drill, um, melatonin, although parents uh, may say that melatonin doesn't really work in part because the issue of the sleep is about anxiety. I will use clonidine, either short acting preparations at nighttime, uh, 0.1 to 0.2 milligrams at bedtime, or I'll put them on the catapress patch, which also helps with some of that anxiety, but um, allows them to uh, regulate themselves at nighttime and during the day. You can use Ativan. Ativan can be helpful prior to trying to go to school if they have a lot of um, separate anxiety, so a small dose of Ativan may be uh, indicated for some of these kids. If, I, if it does ticks, the clonidine and the alpha-adrenergics can be really helpful because they'll treat the ticks um, as well as help with the overall uh, anxiety and the sleep issues. And you can do this and see kind of approach with most of these kids. So you try that acute illness, um, you allow it to resolve, and then you kind of go forward and you don't, you don't really do anything unless you have to present with another episode. And then you, you see, you again treat that episode, and if they resolve and then again present with another episode, then maybe you consider that um, prophylaxis. But initially, um, we do this kind of very, be hypervigilant, um, have a very low threshold for um, checking them for any exacerbations, and just how they do. And many, many of our kids do uh, very well with that and don't need anything further than that. So if you have older children and having a lot of um, protracted episodes, or if you have a kid and they come in and they seem to be having uh, recurrent episodes, it is completely appropriate to consider the addition of an SSRI, Zoloft or Prozac. I find that in a lot of my young kids, obviously parents don't want to do this. They don't want their kid on an SSRI, and so I oftentimes will defer that um, and kind of see how they're doing and if they continue to have episodes, that, particularly that we're having difficulty controlling with prophylactic antibiotics, they'll add the SSRI, and particularly at that time, um, parents usually come around to that idea because their kids will be a little bit older. They are okay in general with um, the use of Benadryl, clonidine um, in their young kids. So, um, you know, the one thing that I do find uh, parents will do even in their kids who are as young as five or six, that they are willing to do the antibiotics plus um, alpha-adrenergic. Um, and, and then um, we will kind of look at the issue about whether or not they need an SSRI. And as I mentioned earlier, it may be that you look at us or psychiatrists and um, taking a look at whether or not um, is panders, um, and especially in those kids who have some severe um, uh, symptoms or presentations. Um, it's important to kind of get a second opinion from us. Slide. Before prophylaxis, once a day dose of antibiotics and SEDs um, throughout the school year, you may have to at times use uh, steroids. Um, so it's not uncommon if I'm having kids who have lots of um, exacerbations that I may end up using those exacerbations given the course, a short course of prednisone. 
um, and that's been uh, shown to be effective. EIG um, is uh, uh, controversial. Um, it can be really hard for kids to get IVIG around here, even when they do have very severe chronic um, uh, pandas. And so I've had to send kids down to Connecticut, or they've had to go down to Washington, D.C. to receive um, a sort of immunotherapy. Um, and so that's something that I think is kind of uh, to explore with outside providers and uh, specialists. An SSRI um, is the same as it would be for those kids uh, who have regular OCD or uh, who have regular issues with depression. Um, and so we'd start with a small dose of Zoloft, um, 25 milligrams a day, fully titrated up um, maybe by 25 milligram increments over the course of a couple weeks each um, to where we find that kids are getting a good response and their symptoms are resolving. It really, really struggling with lots of behavior, um, lots of mood lability or action. It may be that we have to use uh, atypical neuroleptics and mood stabilizers. Um, and so that's, a, that's more of a, in the child psychiatry field, but that is something that um, is uh, sometimes something that we actually uh, think about doing or we may have to do. And I always tell kids and parents to screen their house because if you have a kid who's either having, tr we're having trouble cleaning them or they're presenting with frequent uh, reinfections or exacerbations of their pandas, it may be that either the kid is a carrier or someone in the family is a carrier. And I have at times sent parents, uh, I sent one parent to have a tonsillectomy because the parent was an asymptomatic carrier um, and was chronically exposing, exposing their kid to the pandas. So, so that sometimes can be there as well. Being for family history, you should include screening not only for uh, psychiatric illnesses such as OCD, tics, ADHD, but also autoimmune disorders. Um, thyroid disease tends to be the most common, particularly on the maternal side, um, and that's the one you'll hear most often. Uh, there's been some controversy. People have looked at whether or not tonsillectomy um, in these kids is helpful or not um, when they have persistent uh, strep-related um, exhibitions of their panders. I will tell you that I have have um, in some of my kids who, um, who have been persistently chronically uh, struggling struggle with pandas, I have referred them for tonsillectomies. And in my experience, that that's either, either completely um, cause full resolution of the pandas, or if they do have a future episode of the pandas, it tends to be vi very mild or infrequent. Kids still can get strapped even with the tonsillectomy. There is a small amount of tonsil tissue um, at the base tongue. Uh, so that is there, um, but tends to be uh, much less frequently and with a less severity for kids. So that, that's something that I kind of have on my back burner, but it's something that still um, hasn't really been studied a lot and really has only been, uh, used, only been cited in case, um, case uh, reports. And uh, some case reports show that, yes, it's really helpful, and some case reports that show that, no, it, it doesn't really help at all, depending on, on the particular um, reports that you look at. There are several um, support sites. There's actually a support site for physicians, um, and it's the Pandas Physician Network. They're great. Um, they um, provide uh, supports for physicians, guidelines for physicians, and also um, outline in detail current research that's going out there on PANDAS and on PANDAS-related disorders. And then for parents, I always give them the PANDAS Network um, uh, website, which is, um, is a web specifically um, designed for families of kids with PANDAS. They have local chapters all around the state and the country. Um, and so we have a chapter up here in the Salem area. They oftentimes will run groups, um, and one of our therapists up in Salem actually runs a support group for um, parents and children with pandas. They have additional resources, um, and they have information um, for kids um, and families as well, too. Next slide. So just the resources and the um, guidelines that I had mentioned to you, um, they are available online. They are free, um, and uh, if you, uh, you can easily access them if you want more information. They are very, very comprehensive, so um, they're, uh, they're pretty extensive, um, but they do a nice job of really outlining all the complexity and treatment and uh, all the various treatment that uh, should be done in the pandemic. So I think that's it. Um, I think we have time for some questions, if we have any questions or comments. Back. 
Don't see any questions on the um, question section in the, in the, on the, the portal here, but um, please, uh, feel free to type something in, and uh, Michelle, you can go ahead and read uh, the question and answer it. Sure. as well. Um, if you have any cases that uh, you wanted to run by us, um, we'd be glad to uh, talk about cases. Do you want Michelle? There's uh, um, uh, someone who's made, who's made a comment. Uh, let me see. I, can I use prolactic Keflex and Aleve and have found it to be helpful. Yes, yeah, so absolutely we do use uh, um, we do use a lot of Keflex for kids, um, and uh, so probably common is uh, augmenting Keflex or um, or the tax as a prophylaxis. So absolutely, um, and uh, I, I, there are there is a lot of controversy over kind of that, um, that long term use of antibiotics and and kind of whether or not that could be um, that could be showing you know if if that's okay. Are we kind of masking some something else? So, absolutely, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. All right. Okay. And then I'm trying to screen out. Are there other ones? Okay. Uh, Deborah Pacino has a question. It's all they both started as child. It was children with symptoms, and then it it did a lot. And one of the moms has gotten treatment with Dr. Smith and Whalen, who will treat using Keflex only like I do. Uh, the one offers a lot. She's no longer anxious. She's doing really well. So Robin's from um, this is Prashette. Was... Oh, there's a question from uh, Andrea Sachs. Yeah. Uh, Asking about uh, whether we recommend any special Lyme testing beyond be, beyond the ELISA garden blot uh, at the time of initial diagnosis. So I just want to uh, Andrew was make a comment about um, having some cases where um, the pandas may uh, persist into uh, adolescence or adulthood and does that occur? And are there adults with pandas? And there there have been some case reports and. Um, and uh, reports from uh, physicians and families that that is in fact true, that um, uh, families or uh, parents who actually have pandas that may have gone undiagnosed and get treated and do improve as well too. So I just want to respond to Andrew um, about that. As far as uh, Andrew's question about further time, we do the initial titers, um, and unless we have a suspicion that there may be some underlying uh, Lyme that went undiagnosed there, um, not more than that, but we do want to see the IV, I, IgIG, IgIM um, to see if there's been exposure. And if there's been exposure, then certainly we would want to do more of a workup, um, particularly if we thought that this is an undiagnosed Lyme. Um, and, uh, and it's completely reasonable to say, well, maybe this kid, you know, we have, uh, we have I, 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 IgIG titers are positive here, so the kid clearly had Lyme. Maybe we didn't know about it. Could this be a sign of tertiary Lyme disease? And to do a course of um, antibiotics, do a month course of antibiotics and see, um, see how they respond. We have a, um, a question um, from Sarah uh, Bechta. Um, so do you want to read that out, uh, Michelle, or should I read it? Uh, give it for me because I don't see it in front sure. of me. I'm sorry. Yeah, so, so the question is, I recently saw a 20-year-old patient who has underlying anxiety but had an acute spike in her anxiety with somatic complaints. Mycoplasma titers were positive, so I treated her with Zithromax and Naproxen. How common is it for patients to present in this age as a 20-year-old patient? 
So uh, again, I'm, we're not sure how common it is. It it happened. Uh, what we have seen before is uh, we have had teenage girls who present with eating disorders and anorexia, um, and you know end up on medical units or uh, med psych units needing to have NG tube feeds, and then are discovered to actually have pandas. You treat the pandas, and it, and it goes away. Typically, when they're that severe. Um, they will require some sort of immunotherapy, um, but um, again, I think if you see any kind of sudden onset of any of this stuff, it should be something that it, it would be in the back of your mind, uh, even even though it may not be something that would be uh, common, but just to kind of rule out in the back of your mind if you say, you know what, I'm, I thought about it, but I don't think this is the case. Great. And then Andrea Sachs uh, asked, is there a particular probiotic uh, that you recommend? No, I just recommend the general lactobacilli 1 billion units uh, for kids to take every day. Um, and, not, and sometimes parents will go on to, um, you know, different uh, websites or uh, vitamin supplement place, places to get um, their, um, their, their lactobacilli, their probiotics, but uh, any of them are just as effective. Andrew Baumel um, says, um, I'm not a fan of the Cunningham panel and do not do that test in my patients uh, as I do not feel it is diagnostic. What do you think of the Cunningham panel test? Claire, for me, Andrew, what do you mean by the Cunningham panel? So I'm not sure what you mean by the Cunningham panel. I haven't I haven't heard that um, as a panel, I'm, so I'm not quite sure what that test would entail, um, and um, how that would differ from your normal titers that you do, your normal lab work that you do. So I'm not I can't really answer that for you. I'm sorry. Yeah, he indicates on the te on the text uh, interface that uh, the test is uh, for antineuronal antibodies, and it's done by a lab in Oklahoma called Molecule. For, uh, laboratories. Um. Oh, so, so that's for the NMDA uh, autoimmune encephalopathy. So that particular test is not for pandas or pans. That's for, like I mentioned uh, in uh, St. Callahan's case, that's actually a specific test for NMDA. Um, it's different. Great. Right, it looks like there are no other questions uh, that I see. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kasoli Reardon, uh, and everyone for joining us for this uh, really interesting uh, discussion. Um, so we'll see you next uh, time uh, for our next uh, program in, in December, and we'll have uh, some mail uh, cards with you out uh, just to give you information about that program. So thank everybody. Have a good queue. Thank you. Bye.